Live from Linguini's base of operations, today we will be diving into productivity featuring Bryson from the Productivity Podcast, my thoughts on the daily photo challenge, and a quote. So you're going to want to stay tuned for the dough. See you on the flip side. You are now listening to Linguini's Dough. All right, so today we have we're talking productivity with Bryson from the Productivity Podcast. Um, why don't you go ahead and give yourself an introduction? Yeah, so uh, like you said, my name is Bryson. I'm a CRLA certified study skills and math tutor. That's the College and Reading, the College Reading and Learning Association. Um, I've been tutoring for about four years now um study skills for three of those years started out as just a math tutor though oh wow that's that's good um is it would you consider it a hard task becoming a math tutor and whatnot um yeah so we had to go through two evaluations and everything uh with our you know six months of training the i would say the hardest part is uh keeping it up and keeping consistent Mm -hmm. (laughs) with tutoring it's a very interesting thing because you will have um, students come in and the first time you tutor them it just goes terribly (laughs) you you don't know what strategies to apply to the person yet and though you have especially from training you know we have a lot of different tools and techniques to try and help people but they're all very personalized so it can be a lot of testing the waters early on. Um, and the more that you tutor a specific student, the uh, better you get at that specific student, but not necessarily in general. Because mm-hmm, they all have their own style. Yeah, yeah. And, okay. and some of them fit into certain categories and you get quicker and quicker at diagnosing it. But still, it is uh, every once in a while, you'll come into contact with a student that you'll be like, well, this is something I haven't encountered before. And you have to really problem solve. Mm-hmm. Fake it till you make it. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's not like you don't have the tools to, um, you know, work with the student. It's just that you might not have really applied those tools in that way before. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um. So, what is your definition of productivity? My definition of productivity is a very loose one. <laughs> I yeah. would I would call it the um, art of getting things done. And I don't like to stick to loose definitions, but when you're talking about a term as big uh, and as bulky as productivity, I, it hurts a little bit to say that. But really, productivity has grown so much in a very short amount of time that now it takes on you know hundreds of different forms. Um, some people, for instance, love multitasking, and I think multitasking is terrible. Yeah, I can <laughs> agree on that. <laughs> But, you know, it, it's still grouped under productivity and it is a thing that a lot of people, you know, think of as productive. So it still goes under that category and hence why I would call it an art. It's very subjective. I like that definition. Um, it's kind of like just saying I like music and the same thing with saying I like productivity because there's so much to it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I was, like I said, I was listening to your podcast and you mentioned some things about calendars and I kind of wanted to touch on those a little bit um oh yes i love calendars like <laughs> yeah i only recently started using them about two weeks ago so it kind of was actually helpful advice um so how well do they work for you and it sounds like you're going to recommend them oh absolutely like calendars are such a basic productivity thing but they're that's what makes them awesome you know they're really simple mm-hmm. so and and i believe i mentioned that in the podcast um simplicity Whenever you're trying to imply or just use a new uh, productivity system, you always want to keep it very, very simple, very, very easy. Because as soon as you make a complex system, and especially when you do this early on, it can make you like trapped in this weird void of like information. Mm -hmm. So you've created this complex system, right? But you have no reference to using that system before that point you are completely in the dark working in this just unbelievably complicated and it doesn't even have to be an unbelievably complicated system even just a mildly complicated system creates this translation layer that you have to use 
if, for instance, in a cal calendar, I know a lot of people, they'll input the location and they'll input, um, you know, they'll try and time it exactly right instead of leaving blank space. Mm -hmm. And they'll um, do all these things. And every single time you have to input a date, every single time you have to input something, now you have to fill out every single bit of information. From what and I understand, it just becomes bulky. Yeah, I I agree. Um, and from what I understand is when it becomes a routine or a, not a routine, when it becomes something that becomes a chore and kind of like something that you're gonna have thoughts that you're gonna avoid doing it, it makes it harder to go about doing it. So I like oh, yeah. your advice it, for keeping it, it simple. It doesn't make it easy to follow either. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're trying to follow this and there's a bunch of clutter everywhere, it's going going to just be a pain and you're never going to use it and you're not going to reap the benefit of it as well as um, you'll spend more time thinking about it than yes if you are spending time or spending exorbitant amount of time we'll say that working on your productivity system that is less time that you are actually spending doing the work or getting things done mm-hmm and do you think there's people that a calendar might not be the correct way of going for them to be productive? Uh, well, yeah. And you'd really have to determine that for yourself, if you, like for that person to find if, if it's really for them. Now, calendars are easy to recommend because they are on this really basic level of time management, right? They are often the first thing people use because they're really, really simple. A lot of people use them. And so you can sync up between other people's calendars really well. <laughs> mm -hmm. the, that makes them really versatile and really useful for a lot of people. And I'm sure there are some people that calendars don't work for. Absolutely. Again, with productivity, it's very subjective. Um, some people find a lot of use in things that I don't think are particularly useful. And otherwise, uh, there's many objections to the rule. But in general calendars if you haven't tried them i mean give them a shot because they really can take um the amount of stress you have and the complexity in your daily life they can just completely suck that down make that very manageable in comparison to what it was without one i like that um and in so how do you so i'm gonna say this it's gonna sound generic um how do you use your calendar um just for some context, like, because I started doing calendars about two weeks ago and I put blocks for everything and kind of made it an inconvenient process. Um, <laughs> yeah, you did, you did the overcomplication. Yeah. And it was a big mistake. And now I've worked on downing it to like, hey, this is when I'm actually busy. I should probably put that there or stuff like that. So in that aspect, I guess, how do you use your calendar? So first off, there's an interesting and really helpful aspect about calendars that is um, automated scheduling. So there's a lot of pieces of software where if you have to organize a meeting between two different people, you can do that through, um, I'm, I am recommend like uh, Calendly, I know is one that a lot of people use. That's what I use personally. Good. Um, and I'm not sponsored or anything. <laughs> That's just uh, what I use. And I'm sure there's there's a billion different pieces of software you can use, but that's a really great way to organize between other people. Because what happens is, again, you remove a step of complexity. You remove the fact that you have to actually type in the date mm -hmm. of when something happens. All you have to do is send someone a link and they'll schedule it for you. It'll appear on your digital calendar for you and you don't have to touch it. And it saves, Very simple. Definitely saves Very the texting back and forth for who knows how long. Oh, yes. And, you know, that can go back and forth, especially in something as slow as like email. Oh, <laughs> like yeah. Many, you know, you can spend days in this limbo of when are we going to meet. Um, another thing with automated scheduling is within calendars, if you have recurring dates, absolutely use them. <laughs> I know I've heard of some people who just don't know they exist. You can schedule things to repeat every week. So, you know, if you have a job or something, put, put that in. Um, or, you know, call your mom or something. You could put that in, too. Oh, yeah. Um, again, the less you have to interact by putting things into the calendar, the better. I was actually struggling to find the re reoccurring, and I think I was labeling it wrong, which is... So I'm not gonna... I'm gonna actually apply that to my schedule. Um, I like that. How often do you and, check uh, your, your calendar? 
I check it once in the morning um, to find out a general idea of what I have for the day. Um, that that can be. I I tend to wake up a lot earlier than I have things actually scheduled for, so I I check it you know a couple hours after I wake up. Okay. And at that point, then I get a sort of gauge on when I'm going to have to actually be ready for doing certain things. If I'm going to be um, busy that day, I get a sort of guide the the day of, or if not, you know, the day before, still that morning, check it in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, always a part of a routine because as soon as you put it into a routine, you don't have to think about it anymore. Again, I'll repeat this over and over again. The best productivity system is one that feels very natural and does not create uh, any complexity. It, it feels like smooth <laughs> to go yes. throughout your day. I can agree with that. Okay, so now we talked about calendars. That's something that everyone essentially has access to, and um, it, they're pretty good. They're pretty solid. Just keep it simple, and um, yeah, you'll, they can treat you well if, it, if you do it good. Um, but there's also to-do lists. Um, are you a fan of those? Oh, checklists. That's my next episode coming out on Monday. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, some secret insight. I, I can discuss checklists, though, because I did just do the whole... I recorded my whole episode on it two days ago, so... <laughs> oh, yeah. You're ready for it. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've got my research down. So checklists... And you said to-do lists, but check, uh, to-do lists I categorize under checklists yeah. as, a, as a general checklist, you know? They're, I kind of split them up into two categories. Like I said, there's the general checklists. These are a, like a recurring checklist. These are something that you can use over and over again um, or can use throughout your day to accomplish really basic tasks. Like a to-do list is generally um, covering really basic things, you know, take out the garbage, do the laundry. Mm -hmm. um, things like that. And people find them very useful because they give you a little bit of dopamine every time you cross one off. Oh, right? yeah. They do. <laughs> so you cr cross this thing off and you're like, oh, man, I'm doing really good. But something I find really scary about that is people will push off work through their to-do list because of that do dopamine hit. What they'll do is they'll stack up their day with a bunch of really easy to do tasks that don't actually accomplish much. And instead of doing the larger tasks on that to do list, you know, let's say, um, you know, write the lyrics to a song you're working on or something. Instead, they will just do a bunch of chores <laughs> mm -hmm. and they will keep doing chores and they will keep pushing this thing that they were supposed to get done farther and farther back in exchange for doing the laundry like 50 times so i'm kind of curious Effectively. with that mindset um because in april i actually kind of did a test with that i put to wake up on my to-do list so every single day in april i'd check it off um do you think it's okay to go with those easy things if you only have a couple in there just to get you going oh, onto your absolutely. harder task i actually don't think this is a problem with the easy things at all what I think this is a problem with is the large things. I think you've created, in this situation, you've created those large things and you put them on the to-do list, but you haven't broken them down for, far enough. Like checklists are only really useful when you break every step in them down to something very simple. You know, just check this one thing off. When you have a huge step like writing the lyrics to a song, that's difficult. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to make you want to cross this off your to-do list because well, it's way larger than everything else. Writing the lyrics to a song is hard. You're not going to be motivated to do that in comparison to something easy like folding socks. Mm -hmm. the, the trick is here, it's not actually the problem with these small things. These chores you probably still have to get done. But the thing is, is you have to break down that large task farther. Instead of writing the lyrics to an entire song, say, try and find inspiration for a song. Uh, just one thing. Just find one line. Right? Maybe two lines. I don't know. It depends on your pace, of course, and it's personalized. But whatever it means, if you are pushing off the big tasks in order to do small tasks, it means you aren't breaking them down far enough. I like that, and that is really respectable. Um, just one more question going along with it is, 
So yeah, you're going along your day, you finally break down your task to write a song and you break it down into multiple steps. Um, what do you think is the point where you're putting too much details into it, too much simple stuff that it's going to actually hurt your productivity? Oh, are you talking about the fact that when you again create complexity in your checklist now? <laughs> yes, so that you've, exactly. <laughs> you've grown it to a huge size. Oh no. Checklists they aren't perfect. And I think this is actually where they can't falter. Mm -hmm. Me personally, um, I, that's why I break them down into multiple different kinds. And I wouldn't put writing a song under a general checklist at this point. No, that will never get done. <laughs> I, stumbled, I stumbled across this, um, this question too in my, in my research of applying checklists to my own life. Um, and yeah, it, it puzzled me for quite a while. I was like, how do I apply this? But that's when I started breaking it up into a project or a task checklist and, you know, a general checklist. And me personally, I've completely gotten rid of a general checklist. Mm -hmm. um, now, I didn't find it personally useful for me. Um, it really didn't make me uh, feel any better. It didn't make me do any more per day. Um, I tended to just do it in my head without focusing on having to keep this checklist with me or to-do list with me. And I think uh, that's a pretty solid conclusion to come to. But as far as to-do lists go, they still can be helpful for these uh, general tasks. And again, smaller, but still larger tasks too. But if we're talking about doing something huge, like a big project, you should, you should split that up into its own checklist, if so. Mm -hmm. So, hey, now I guess we're working on writing a song, right? Oh, yes, we were writing. This is a great idea because, um, or I, I think a great example, because it's something that people can relate to really highly. It, it applies to many things. It's very difficult. It requires creative work, research, and tons of different past knowledge to do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it fits a lot of different scenarios. What are some maybe productive myths that you've heard or seen people suggest? Oh, man, can I talk about multitasking? Mm. Oh wow. Multitasking. <laughs> the <laughs> So this is something that is really pervasive and has been for a long time in productivity. It's the idea, right, of I mean, doing things at once, doing multiple things at the same time. And mm. its name is honestly completely trash. <laughs> I think, because in reality, you never end up doing multiple things at once. What you do is just constantly switching between different things. That, yes, I can attest to that. Um, it's not multitasking, really. The, the name is a lie in itself. Your brain cannot focus on doing multiple things at once. Now, when we're talking about doing things that you don't have to focus on, you can, you can multitask. Um, take, for instance, like I go on a walk every day, right? And I listen to either music or an audio book when I do so. Mm -hmm. That is, I would call that multitasking. And you'll notice neither of the things I have to do require a lot of attention. Now, they can take a lot of attention. You know, if I wanted to, I could uh, focus on taking every single step and basically meditate while I walk. Or I could, you know focus deeply on a song and try and learn a lot from it. But in general, if I'm just kind of walking away listening, I don't have to be focusing. And that, that's where multitasking can work just fine. But in general, people try and push multitasking to this crazy limit of like answering email with like playing a video game on a Twitch stream and like oh, yeah. <laughs> doing all sorts of weird stuff. And it's like you are not actually going into depth in any of those scenarios. You're not actually uh, being effective at any of them. You're just being bad at all of them. Uh, uh, what is the quote? It's a, a skill of many, a master of none, something like that. Oh, yes. Jack of all trades. That's what I was looking for. And, I, and from, from what I've researched as well is I've heard that it's just humans are not designed to multitask. And like you're saying, it's losing your focus or at least putting less focus and kind of spreading it out and making crappy work. Yeah, your, your brain cannot do that. It cannot focus on multiple things at once. 
If any of the work you are doing in your quote unquote multitasking requires focus, it's not multitasking. It is just switching between a bunch of tasks really quickly and just tanking your performance. And I mean, it just doesn't feel good. If you're constantly switching back between things, you're never going to get into a flow state. You're never going to actually, um, you know, settle down. Your, your work is going to be wiry. And you're going to get tired out fast. Dang right. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel when you're in your free time? I kind of struggle with free time because I get mad at myself for not being productive sometimes. Um, like, Ooh, that's a, that's a misconception too, if that's what you're worried about. Yeah. Is that free time? Man, that's important. That's super huge in productivity, you know? Mm-hmm. That, that free time prevents you from getting burnt out, which would absolutely, again, tank your performance. And burnout is not something you recover from soon. Yeah. I mean, as long as you have free time and a reasonable amount of free time, that is a huge step in productivity. And that is an absolute must. Uh, For me, what I do in my free time is basically whatever I feel like. I leave a huge blank space in my calendar for it. The, uh, I might, you know, by, I leave a huge blank space and what, Ever I feel like doing that day I do and you'll notice I say day because I don't try and schedule free time um, into days where I also do other things where I have things that are you know work-based or um, otherwise scheduled you just keep it the simple re- and yes and that's so I can wake up in the morning look at my calendar and see nothing on it right you know I look up look at it in the morning mm-hmm I see absolutely nothing on it, and I know I can do whatever I want all the way through me going to sleep. Doesn't matter. That's a way healthy mindset. Um, something that definitely needs to be implemented in my life and just more people as well. Because yeah, and linking back to calendars, what I said earlier, I I mentioned batching your work so that it lines up on similar days, even if it is a basic task, lining it up on days that you already have things to do. Because when you have one full day of doing work and one full day of break, that's so much better for you than two half days of work. Yeah. Um, so I guess a lot of people are morning people. A lot of people are night people. Um, we all have our own 24-hour clock. We just spend it differently. So what time do you feel like you're the most productive in? Oh, man. That's a lot a lot of these like productivity people are very much like morning people and i would not say i'm a natural morning person at all mm-hmm. when i wake up i i uh, try and do things that are very mindless things that are very routine like i wake up in the morning i take a shower brush my teeth and eat and then i go on a walk and by the time i get back i'm sort of chilled out then and that's when i can actually start getting things done and generally it takes me a long time to build up into working and i i can go pretty late um to when i'm fully especially in creative work when i'm or research which is what i really love to do Mm -hmm. i can i would say i'm generally most efficient probably around the 7 p.m to 9 p.m mark um it's very late Mm-hmm. But I do, I do tend to go to bed r- relatively at a normal time around ten thirty. So, so for me, I don't have a naturally biological, um, quote unquote, productive timing. But really, that doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Your bio- biology, you know, you can't really. It doesn't matter. What really matters is how you spend your time when you are effective. Um, And so I tend to, again, with creative work, do a lot of research during that time. It's the most enjoyable thing that I love about creative work is looking into other ideas and try and expand knowledge itself. Mm -hmm. With that comes like the question of, oh, should I work on something that I'm not as good at during that more effective time to try and balance it? And I don't think that's a good idea at all. (laughs) No. (laughs) What um, what you should do is do the most fun thing that you want to do, like to be productive at that efficient time. And really, if you lean hard on that, you will get better at every other area, too, because when I'm doing research, I'm not just getting better at research. You know, 
your knowledge is not in a vacuum. And when you learn something, you can also expand other areas of knowledge too. I've never even thought of that specifically where it's just timing when you work on certain things just for knowing that you'll be more efficient in I'm wording this weird, but just knowing how to correctly per- do the correct task with the correct timing. Um, yes, and, and again, watch out for it because, again, it can get very complicated very fast. Yes, keep it uh, simple. Yes. It, if you know that there's one time that you particularly are really effective during, then do that. But any more than that, and it gets really complicated. Mm-hmm. So um, don't try and expand it out to say, oh, I'm not very efficient at this time, and I'm sort of efficient at this time, and I'm pretty good here, but I'm not really good here. It's, it's going to become a mess. You yeah. Know? So sure. I would say if you're going to uh, think about that, just think about the one really effective time. Okay. Um, so you've, you've been productive. Um, what point do you consider it a successful point that you've been productive? Like, you've successfully been productive for that day or successfully been productive for those past few hours. Here, here is where I'm very much um, anti-goal driven. You know, I, I like to determine my like, ability based on input rather than output. If I spend you know, all day looking at these goals, uh, like, uh, like I said, I don't use a to-do list. The the feeling you get when at the end of the day, right, when you have a to-do list and it's all completed is like a big sigh of relief. You mm-hmm. feel really good until the next day where you get hit with another to-do list. I don't really like that method. Um, I think it's just, uh, I believe it's referred to as a treadmill to-do list um, mm-hmm. where it just keeps circulating over and over again. And really, I think that's a bad way to uh, deal with things long term. It works really well. Again, why I like the task checklist so much if dealing with just one project because it's over. But a to-do list is never over. And when you constantly are dealing with this um, to-do list of things that should be habit or should be something that you can do mindlessly, it's going to weigh on you. Now, with productivity in general, I try and not focus on feeling productive. Um, I just try and do things well in the moment. I think about what I'm doing then. And that's, that's what my calendar is for, you know, the it allows me to do that. Because when I look at it, I can plan, sure. But then I never have to think about it for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. You've already got kind of a routine going and Exactly. And it clears out my brain for thinking, which is what it's good at. You know, it's not good at remembering. Mm-hmm. The when you focus your entire life on being, you know, this weird actualized version of productive, you end up not actually focusing on being productive. And that's a weird, you know, contradictory statement, right? But to expand on it, what I'd say is the instant is the most important thing. Mm-hmm. If you spend on doing the right thing right now, that's what's important. And you'll feel better after. You don't have to feel better for any reason. You don't have to feel better for, say, I was productive today. I, that just doesn't even cross my mind. I don't think about it. That's an unhealthy mindset that's going to make you either overwork yourself or underwork. Yes. And what I think it's, is really bad about it is when you don't have a productive day and you you lay there in bed or whatever and you say, wow, I suck. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I did a bad job. That just kills you, you know, especially long term. If that happens, you know, multiple times, which it often does because people, when they start focusing on productivity, they often go way too hard into it. I mean, they set really unreasonable goals for themselves that they can't maintain long term. Mm -hmm. And they push themselves away from the entire idea of productivity at all. That's, um, that's really sad. You know, you've, you've got to watch out for that. And so that's what I say. I say, instead of basing your life goal around your output of if I'm productive today or not, instead, focus on it on the input, focus on doing a good job right now. My boss, his son, he plays soccer and they didn't win the match, but he said that, um, um, he's like, my son, he didn't, 
Um, he didn't win the game, but he did put in his input. He did put in the most effort he could, and he looks really good for doing that, even though he didn't win the game. He's proud of what he did. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the minute you start focusing on exclusively output for your um, you know, accomplishment for how you feel, it's going to go downhill as soon as that output falters even a little bit, even when it's normal. You know, absolutely everyone has days where you know, they didn't do as much as they wanted to. That doesn't matter. What matters is that you focus hard on doing a good job that day. Mm -hmm. Focus hard on the now. The best time is now. The second best time, or the best time was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. <laughs> um, the goals are really, um, they're meant to aim you, right? You're meant to have goals for the future as sort of this wide net that you cast. You say, I'm going in that direction. Mm -hmm. But they are not good to base your own value on. <laughs> no. Um, so I guess uh, talking about value, um, I guess this wouldn't be value, but just in your, when there's people you meet that generally just don't want to be productive, I guess, um, maybe they just, I don't know, not, it's not for everyone, obviously. So oh, I can yeah, respect definitely that. Not. Um, what's kind of your mindset towards just people who choose not to be productive out of not wanting to be? I don't well, know if that makes long, sense. For a long time, I really hated the word um, productivity or what have you when I started high school, per se. Mm -hmm. the, and the reason why I hated it is because during like middle school, it was always pushed down my throat of that productivity looked like this. You had to do this. You had to do that. And then you had uh, those people you, that were like, I'm so much better than you because I'm productive. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you have to keep a rigid planner. You have to write down everything just it, it was ridiculous and honestly the way they teach it and at least the american school system is hilariously bad it is yep Product, productivity is always going to be based on voluntary want you're never going to be able to force someone into quote unquote being productive it just doesn't work the thing is is this perception that's been uh, created about productivity that it looks like this and that it's very rigid and it's very robotic often mm -hmm. that that really warps people's perception and it makes them not want to do it i know i certainly didn't because that's what i thought it was <laughs> that uh i think is is those people that don't want to be productive you know they look at it as this robotic and harsh system mm -hmm. A way of judging people and yes and they they have these negative experiences with it that they push out in the form of saying i don't want to i don't want that mm -hmm. it's not necessarily that they don't actually want it as much as they don't think they want it yeah so i would say to have an open mind if you are like that i would say to um you know look into some really basic stuff you know extremely basic um say one thing a lot of people do for productivity is decluttering. Just do something basic, something easy. Um, like pick your junk drawer and just declutter it. Mm -hmm. You know, something that doesn't take very long. Um, and it might make you feel better. And if it makes you feel better, then there you go. Now, now you've improved your life in some small way. And you can. And that's from great. Yeah. Absolutely. Productivity again, it's an art. There is so many different ways to go about it and so many different intricate styles that work for some people and don't work for other people. It's like someone, if someone says they don't like productivity, it's kind of the same way that they would say they don't like music. It's like, how can you really say that when there's so many forms of music? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Have you listened to every bit of music? Probably not. You probably can't make a very informed decision on it. No. Um, the same way with productivity, you you can't really make that wide net um, judgment on it without trying a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Trial and error. Um, Absolutely. And then I guess just, I think probably the next most important thing, or one of the, probably the most important thing with being productive, of course, that's a niche term, not a niche, that's a, a very broad term, um, would probably be routines. Um, and so just oh, how much yes, do you habit. think those matter? 
Habit is one part of productivity that a lot of people um, really push hard. And I think uh, habits, they've taken this place as sort of the pinnacle of productivity in a lot of people's minds. Like, if I can make my habit every day to do some, I don't know, like wake up at three in the morning, some people think they have some crazy stuff. Um, wake, if I wake up at three in the morning every single day, and I read a book for two hours every day, and I do you know, all these things. I exercise for three hours every day. They kind of make it. They think life. of that as like this huge precipice to reach to, and so they they say, "Oh, I'm going to take it in small steps." So I'm just going to start exercising for three hours every day. <laughs> and it's like you've you've cut cut it down from all these um, tasks, but your the task you've cut down is still massive. No one's going to be able to just start exercising three hours a day every day, especially and long keep that as a consistent habit. I mean, they you can't um, form these habits in this really uh, harsh way. You have to do it very organically. Mm-hmm. And I would say the biggest thing is honestly with habits is to try and get rid of bad habits before you start really focusing on getting good habits. Bad habits do a lot more bad for you than good habits do good most of the time. And they're usually there's, not as easy to switch around. Yeah, there's very few exceptions. The only one I would say that's like a really huge one that is like above all is sleep. You have to get a very consistent, you know, very good amount of sleep every night. That's the sort of habit where I can recommend it to absolutely everyone. You should do that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's, that's just... You know, it'll extend your lifespan. It'll do a billion different things for you. It's a great thing to do. Do it. <laughs> and it just feels good. <laughs> yeah. The, so these habits, it's important not to give them, you know, this grand mythical idea, but instead focus on breaking them down again into small parts and saying, okay, I'm going to, you know, let's say like with the going to sleep one, good way to do that is to just start going to the sleep at the same time every night. Mm-hmm. Now, you'll notice that you don't even have to wake up at the same time. Just going to sleep at the same time will drastically change your sleep pattern. And, you'll, and it will force it into a very natural, but a very healthy way. And you'll always want to have that good amount of sleep. Oh, absolutely. Especially once you get into the habit of it. You'll, you know, if you ever stray from that again, you'll be like, how could I ever do this? Yep. Which you, in- you probably will, you know, at some point, you know. When I was in high school, I used to go to bed at like one in the morning and wake up at six. And now I can't even oh. imagine doing that. I'm like, uh, I'm good. Yeah, that sounds that sounds harsh. And I, I had insomnia for a long time. So oh, really? I, I, I would try and go to go to sleep and then I couldn't go to sleep. And it was just terrible. So, you know, I'd get like one hour, maybe 30 minutes of sleep per night sometimes. And uh, just oh, awful. Could I ask how you, like, what helped you best? Was it going to bed at a consistent time that helped you get past the insomnia? Or Really, I wish I could say, but I have no idea. <laughs> with, just, uh... with that, um, it's, it's kind of come and gone uh, with my life. Like, I'll have many you know, months of, you know, I'll have like 13 or 14 months of no insomnia, and then like two months of really bad insomnia, and then a huge break again. Wow. And then it all comes back. And it never seems to correlate with anything in my life, which is the weirdest thing. You know, I think it would correlate with stress or something, but it'll be like the middle of the summer and I have like, I have nothing going on and I'm just having fun and I'll just have really bad insomnia. Wow. That's weird. It's really whack. That, insomnia is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't sound fun. Sorry. <laughs> Very uh, lame. Um, I guess what are your goals for being productive? I guess what well my I guess, goals <laughs> i don't think i like this question anymore because what you've said is it's the input and it's the input that your goal is it's just what you input um the output yeah it's fine whatever it comes out to so i actually dislike that question and when you so when you hit those points of um i guess let's just say you accidentally were overworked yourself you're working on writing that song late at night and you end up just and you keep doing this for a few weeks and you end up overworking yourself. What's been your experience with that? Overworking is um, absolutely something I have huge experience with. <laughs> as, a, as a student, um, there is 
a very large emphasis on like finals, right? Mm -hmm. So it comes to two weeks before finals, and then you're like, okay, these next two weeks are going to be hell. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) And you kind of get stuck in this pattern of, okay, I'm going to study for 14 hours a day. Okay, seems pretty normal. And I'm just going to keep doing that. And I think weekends, well, weekends, that just gives me even more time to study. And you'll just, just stack, stack a huge amount of um, info like that. And by the time you actually get to finals week, you just feel terrible and you do awful. Mm-hmm. And now me necessarily, I, I'm weird, so I don't do awful most of the time. But it's very easy to. Mm-hmm. Especially those two weeks and just, nope. Yeah, and it's some, something that, again, like, when I deal with uh, students, they'll often take this really crazy schedule of studying, uh, and it's just bad for them. And I often tell them, I'm just like, hey, don't do that, because mm-hmm. um, that overworking really is is a absolute killer to productivity. People think they're getting more done, when in reality, they are hurting themselves so much. And it just affects their general mindset as well, because... When you're like, okay, I didn't study as much as I hoped I would, then you feel down for a minute, and that's just going to make your finals even worse. Oh, yeah. You know, they, they've equipped it now with a output-based goal. Um, so in general, with overworking, I mean, I, I have a lot of experience with it, both firsthand and secondhand. And on, it's very hard to say what to do after you're done besides just try and learn from it, you know? Try and really think about how you feel at that moment, you know, and be like, was this worth it? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because I almost guarantee that you will say, no, I would have rather just taken one day of break and like hung out with my girlfriend. That would definitely be a win. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Do you think, I don't know if you diet or I don't really know anything about you that much. So if you do diet, I I do. You do? um, Pretty heavily. But, mostly for a a medical reason so i kind of cheat for it Uh, okay um well do you think in general it can help play into people's productivity i know it might be different for you and um so my experience with diet was i kind of always ate pretty standard um for an american diet you know it's not not good definitely but not horrific Mm -hmm. the uh, up until recently, I got diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, so um, I you know, hooked up with my nutritionist to try and get that down. So, I mean, recently I've been on basically the most, one of the most restrictive diets that's out there. It's oh, the man. autoimmune protocol. That sucks. Um, it's very, I mean, it's healthy, um, obviously, and I'm doing it under a nutritionist. Don't do it unless you're under a nutritionist. Mm-hmm. I'm looking that out there. Um, but I mean, my experience with it has been that for the first month, it's really hard, right? First month, the whole time you're thinking about like what you can and can't do. And that's a really bad mindset. (laughs) First off, Mm -hmm. um, when you focus on what you can and can't do all the time, everything becomes instead of what it is, which is a gray area, everything becomes very black and white, you know, and especially restrictive diets in general, I would not recommend them to people unless you're under a very specific scenario. Like for me, I, it makes sense. Mm-hmm. But for most people, restrictive diets are a terrible idea because, you know, no one wants to say that they're never going to eat like, I don't know, pie again. And that, that would be a, a very generic thing to say. And that's likely not even going to happen. Absolutely. It's never. It, You'd have to be David Goggins, you know, the <laughs> the actual act of um, doing that really just pushes you down. You say, oh, well, this sucks. And you might sound excited when you say it at first, but uh, with time, that's just going to degrade. So restrictive diets are never a good idea um, in these general scenarios. Mm-hmm. What I do think is a much better idea for them is to focus on doing more, eating more good and less bad rather than completely cutting off bad altogether. Mm-hmm. I like um, that. That's... And 
a lot yeah, more and by, simple. And... By good, you know, there's a hundred definitions of good. Ask your doctor, ask a dietitian, because I, I don't know for sure. But what I can say is completely cutting yourself off from something that you enjoy is never a good idea. Yeah. Unless it's like smoking, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess, is there anything else you want to maybe add and that I might have missed and along those lines? Well, um, as of recently, I, do you mind if I talk about my experience with a very uh, niche method of note taking? <laughs> no, I don't mind at all. Go ahead. <laughs> so I'm, I'm planning on doing an episode on note taking in the future. So this is some insider info. It's very exciting. And I've, I've taken out trying a bunch of different note taking methods. And one of them that I'm trying right now is called a Zettelkasten. A Zettelkasten? A Zettelkasten. It's a okay. German word. Like it. I really don't know what it means, but it's not very important. What it means isn't important. Mm -hmm. What it is, is basically a collection of like note cards. In my, my instance, I'm using it on a program on my computer, but the original ones were on note cards. Mm -hmm. And you basically wrote down an idea that you had under a specific topic and put it in this box. And then you connected all of them with this like intricate framework of like links. So you see how it transcribes over to digital really well. Oh, yeah. Kind but the idea is you keep this forever and you just keep accumulating this huge, like massive quantity of a lot of your own original ideas. And that's an important thing. They have to be original ideas. Oh, OK. Um, so even so you'd never put them like you'd never archive them. You'd, you'd always just keep them there. And if you ever need to look back, they're there. Yeah. And the thing is, it's not like if you ever need to look back, what you do is you almost keep this as you work through it now, whenever you have to write something or anything like that, um, especially in creative work, it works really well, or supposedly it does. I'm, I'm only about a week into it so far. I have about 150 things I've written in here. Wow. The basic, you know, premise is when you go to write something now, and you have this topic, you know, you can, you can basically just flip through the note cards until you find something cool. And you're like, okay, this is something that I'm going to expand upon. And you can follow those links and follow a trail of thought. And basically have a rough draft written for you through this mass collection of notes. You could finally end up writing that song. Oh, yeah. I mean, I guess you could do it musically. That'd be really, that'd be kind of cool. I don't know how you would do I guess you'd do it. You'd have to do it in, um, you know, I don't think there's a program for it, but you probably could do it on note cards with sheet music. Mm -hmm. You'd be, you'd be a, a real pioneer there if you want to try that out. <laughs> yeah, but I never knew about that method of just note taking and that, that is really cool. Um, so so I've, been, I've been trying this and um, it's pretty interesting so far. The, I really like... Um, how easy it is to come up with new ideas based on it that's the biggest thing mm -hmm. and also with it it's not particularly um difficult to create like it's very especially the program i'm using is obsidian um there's another program too that's kind of similar it's called rome research which is larger but i like obsidian more because it's simpler i always like simpler mm -hmm. the what's really great about it is Again, that simplicity. If you try and take notes through a very rigid structure, like um, Notion, for instance, um, a lot of people do Notion. Notion. It's, Notion's really good because it's very powerful, but due to that um, you know, powerful nature, it's also become really, really rigid. So every time you want to do something, you have to scroll through pages and you have to click on a bunch of different links. and That's just a pain. Mm-hmm. This is really nice um, because throughout my day, I just take random notes on a physical, I have a Moleskine notebook that I just take a bunch of notes in um, of random ideas that I have throughout the day, you know, and it, they could be stupid ideas. I can think like, hmm, ducks fly really strangely if you pay attention, <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, it could be dumb. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. The important thing is that you just take that note down and take down this random idea that you have. And, and you, then later on in that day, you can go and put it into your Zettelkasten or not put it in. If In the case of the duck one, I probably wouldn't put it in. <laughs> darn. 
but you can, you know, put them in and refine them and make connections between things that you already have in there. Because oftentimes you'll use the same words, you know. You'll say, um, like, for instance, I was um, writing on vacation minimalism. This is one of my, one of my notes from today. Mm-hmm. This was an idea I heard um, and kind of expanded on a little bit. So I wrote down as a very rough version, pay attention to what you do on vacation. If you don't do something you normally would do, that means that it probably is draining you in some way. This is I just can, a, I can respect that. Um, and, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a great idea. Like, I don't think it applies to everything perfectly well. Oh, yeah. But, sometimes we got to step out of our comfort zone. And... But what's important is that I wrote it down. Mm-hmm. And now that, now that it's there permanently, I can analyze it later if I ever need to, or never pay attention to it again. It doesn't matter. And when you write these, do you usually put enough detail that you can understand what you were thinking at that moment? Or do you just just and, general and that, write whatever it was on your mind? So that's the thing, is the physical note version of it is extremely quick, and I do it just so I can um, fill it in later in that day. Okay. So, so it doesn't have to have a ton of context. It doesn't have to be... Um, perfect it just has to be a very quick jot again make it as fluid as possible as easy to use as possible Mm -hmm. then later on in the day i can refine it and make it more legible and put it into the zettel costin that is definitely something i i want i want to try and probably actually do yeah that's that's interesting for your for your 30 day challenge i thought that would be an interesting one i I challenge you to it for sure i will do that (laughs) Um, There's a book particularly that I read um, called How to Take Smart Notes Mm -hmm. um, by Sanka Aran that really goes into the topic fully. Um, That's for your listeners and for you if you want to uh, Mm -hmm. check it out if you you ever plan on trying to build a Zettel custom. But um, yeah, I I thought it was interesting. Um, I thought it was such a weird way to... uh, provide note taking to the average person's life because that's what's also interesting about it is it's a note taking but it applies to a lot more than just you know say students or professors Mm -hmm. which or researchers it it applies to really everyone it's your whole imagination yeah and uh you can use it as like the second brain to process things for you and basically use it as your intuition you know it is your own ideas so everything that you take out of there is going to be original everything that you take out of there is going to be your own thought and even just the act of writing things in there is going to make you learn really really well and really really effectively and that's in uh, study skills tutoring like that's a big thing that we mention on note taking is you don't even have to look back at your notes ever what's important is that you wrote them down in the first place, because the act of writing them down really, really helps your learning, and writing in general is thinking. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think that's all the questions I have in regards for you. Um, you think you want to introduce or let people know, remind them of your podcast and who you are again? Before we close yeah. Up. So, <laughs> again, my name's Bryson. And I, I'm also the host of the Productivity Podcast. If you want to check that out, the, um, the link I'm sure will be in the description of this podcast. But if you want to type it in, the link is anchor.fm forward slash B-R-I-S-O-N dash C nine, the no- number nine. Uh, yeah, I mean, check it out if you're interested. And uh, thank you for having me on the podcast. I, I really love talking about productivity and I listen to a bunch of your episodes and they're pretty awesome. Uh, I really liked I really like the interview. Basically. Thank you, Bryson. Um, I appreciate that. And it's been, you've been very insightful too. Um, there's just a lot of little things I've never even thought about till this past week when I've listened to your podcast and just listening to you in this conversation today. So... With that, I think I will end this episode. Hope to have you on again. Yeah, see you around. That information was awesome. Moving on, we're going to mix the dough with a quote.
I just realized that I can't convince myself that nothing bad is ever going to happen. That is out of my control. So what I tell myself instead is that when bad things do happen, I trust myself to be able to deal with the situation. And that's by Simone Geertes. Um, This was one of her tweets. Um, I don't remember if it was a reply or just an actual tweet itself. I think it was a reply. Um, but I thought it was good. Um, my, my mind likes to tell me I won't handle situations well. Um, and yeah, bad things do happen and I know I'll make it through. It's just, I never feel like I'm going to do the situation in the correct manner, I guess. So I would like to try applying this method more where when there's a bad situation that I will trust my decision making to handle it better. Like if something financial happened and I'm kind of all panicked, I would be like, okay, this sucks, but hopefully I'll handle it, handle it well, whether that actually happens or not. Worst case scenario, you learn from your mistakes. For some background on Simone, uh, she made the Truckla ad, if you've ever seen that, and she used to have a brain tumor in the past. So this is kind of where she was, this is the mindset she had while she was dealing with all that. Um, it sounds like she's doing good now. And I honestly, I feel like it's easy to forget that we can die just at any moment. Um, I remember one time I was, don't fact check me on this, but I was reading uh, Ask Reddit thread or something like that. And someone mentioned that they just, their husband just died to adulting. Like, just went to sleep and woke up dead from, I guess, adulting. I don't know. It was, it was interesting. So. We can die at any moment, and it's kind of a good mindset to just be like, hey, I will hopefully handle these well, every situation. And you're not always going to handle them well, that's the truth. Um, So, there's that. Um, So the next time something bad does happen to me, I'm going to try applying this mindset. But I think it's also important to keep in mind to apply it when something good happens as well. Because it works vice versa. Obviously more ideal in the bad situation that you will trust yourself to handle it well and be content with whatever does end up happening. But you can apply it to the good outcome as well, at least how I view it. Um, so yeah, I think I've said enough about this quote. On to the next piece of dough. Do you know the We are now moving on to our next piece of dough. So this is in regards to my daily photo challenge. Um, I'm about 80%, of 80, 90%. I'm almost, there's only a few days left in June. And I will say it is definitely a challenge, but I am glad I did it. Um, it does feel like sometimes it ends up being quantity over quality. And I'm more of, I'm like the B plus, you know, I don't quite like perfection, but I don't like garbage. I like the in-between where it's quality but like it still gets released at a somewhat consistent basis. Um, consistency is how you progress, and then quality is what gets people actually engaged and makes you proud of what you've made. So a little balance of in-between is what I like. Um, I feel like the photo challenge focuses a lot on the quality rather than the quantity aspect. I said that backwards. It focuses more on the quantity than the quality aspect, which I'm not a fan of. Um, but it is good practice, so yeah. And honestly, this challenge helped me manage my time better because the first few days I was really busy and I didn't even take the photos the first few days. Um, so yeah, I, I didn't 100% complete this challenge, but I got most of the days, so I, I say I did a good job. Um, but yeah, so it just kind of taught me like this is how I put it on my to-do list. This is how I can integrate it into my calendar. Um, like I started using a calendar this month and for some reason I've never previously been able to like get into one and lately I have, um, I do need to look at how I'm using it to see if I'm actually using it the most effective way. I was listening to a podcast that he'll, he'll be a guest on one of the episodes actually. And the way he worded his advice, it was, it really made me think how I'm properly doing the calendar. So it did get me started on the calendar and Now I just have to tweak and figure out what works best for me. So I'm glad I did the daily photo challenge for that. Um, 
weirdly enough, when I'm in a bad mood, photography is something I like. Um, cause I feel like I tell good story through the photos when I'm in a bad mood and it kind of like shows how I feel without it's how you should be telling people how you feel, but I kind of struggle with that sometimes. And so I feel like that was a good perk to it. Um, and those photos were usually the ones that were the best, the ones that I was proud of and would set as profile pictures on discord and whatnot. And if you strive to be a good photographer, this goal is honestly great. It teaches you like if you can focus on how to get different angles, composition, all that stuff, great challenge for you. Um, I just kind of have photography as a hobby. So for me, it was more just to be productive than it was to make my composition and all that better. Well, I was a little bit hoping to get better with that. That's part of it. But for me, that wasn't most of it. But if you are going to be a photographer, it is definitely something I recommend and it will help you grow to find more unique shots and all of that stuff. You know, nothing crazy fancy, but it's a good practice. Um, <laughs> being good at photography does not equal growth. Um, you know, I was, was that like 90 something followers last month and I was like, I'll do this challenge and maybe it will get me to hundred Instagram followers. It did not update. Um, but I wasn't really striving for growth through it. If I was doing that, then I, I don't know how to explain it, but there's certain ways that you have to handle social media in order for growth. Um, a lot of the times that's not how you want to handle the content you do. Um, cause you, you gotta make something engaging as well. Gotta make it discoverable. There's a lot to it. And I was just posting the images because that's enough. Oh, there's Machu barking. But yeah. Lighting can also be hard to master, but when you do, then the well, the photos are well lit up. It really does add to them. So that's one of the things, if you want to be a photographer, it helps you learn like how to handle the lighting better. Um, it's just repetition of stuff I said earlier. So that was another good thing I got out of it. Um, an unhealthy part I noticed about this challenge was I was paying too much attention to the likes I got on Instagram. Um, you can do this in a, I'm trying to grow my social brand, my social media brand, and that can be healthy in a sense. Um, but I knew, cause I don't really care if my Instagram takes off or not. Uh, I mean, I would like it to, but I don't really care that much. Um, so I was looking at it from, I don't even know, I don't know how to explain it exactly. Just not the healthiest mindset based off the likes. I wasn't disappointed. Well, I don't know. Just be careful if you're looking at likes cause it can hurt you. Uh, this challenge was also very hard to remember to keep doing, but it was very rewarding. Um, I will not be doing it ever for more than a month though. That will lead to burnout so quick. Some people can handle daily stuff. For me, weekly is where it's at. It keeps me disciplined enough that I keep working on it and don't fall into the abyss of not doing anything. And then as well as it gives me time to have breaks because you need breaks, in my opinion. Some people can do daily. Like PewDiePie, he does daily videos. He's tired. He works hard though. So, you know, it just all depends on the person. So for me, I recommend the 30 day photo challenge. If you're either looking to be a photographer or if you're just looking to get yourself to do something every day to get in the habit of being more productive, I guess. So with that all said, we're going to head to the ending statement and I'll see you guys then. All right. So my guests are Bryson from the productivity podcast. Links will be in the description. Go check them out. Uh, my challenge for July is going to be to read a little bit every day. And if you have any ideas for the podcast, just let me know and I could likely talk about it. Um, if you don't understand what Linguini's dough is, this is where we start with a base piece of dough, which can really be about anything. I do try to keep it specific and bake that productivity, finances, business, and self-improvement, but I roll it around from time to time. The voice actor in this video is user slash Lendry from Reddit, spelled L-E-N-D-R-Y. Go check him out if you want a reliable voice actor. The songs in this episode are Slug Love 87, Go On Going, Geronigos, Digital Memories, and Witness, all from the YouTube library. So I'll see you guys on the next one. Bye.